All right, we're going to be doing convergence IC touch-up on a Mitsubishi CRT rear projection television. You may have noticed that the top half of the cabinet, including the screen and projection mirror, are gone from this one. You do not need to remove this from yours if you're following along at home. The only reason that that is inside the house and missing from this one is because I had to transport this into separate pieces. So obviously, like I mentioned before, if you're following along at home, you don't need to do that. Just kind of ignore that anomaly here. Basically, this starts pretty straightforward. This back panel comes off here. We've got some screws here in the usual places. Just kind of keep track of where the black screws and the shiny screws go. Basically, there's three black screws on each side, there and here. And then there's some shiny ones by the I.O. area and where the power connector attaches. So I'm going to yank those off and then you're going to see what it looks like inside. Oh, and that goes without saying, unplug the mains before you get started. After you've done that, you do want to keep track of your screws and not lose them. I realize most of you, if you're following along at home, probably won't be working on this outside, but it actually isn't a bad idea because if the ICs need to be reflowed, then it's probably also at a point where the rest of the set could use a good cleaning so it's not a bad idea to if, it, if at all possible safely to wheel one of these outside and blow the dust out now I actually won't have access to my own air compressor until later this evening so I'm gonna have to wait a little while but I'm gonna go ahead and yank that board out so that I can get started with the repair here's what it looks like inside though a little up you can see it's pretty simple there's not a whole lot going on in here there's the power board down here, main board, and then the signal board is all behind this box here, and they all connect together. Basically, what's going to have to happen is this main board here is what's going to have to come out. These two convergence ICs are the offending components that get the cold solder joints. So basically, we're going to have to undo all the connectors that are holding it down and holding it back, and also remove the screws holding it down obviously. Instructional guides actually recommend sliding the whole chassis out but in the past it just didn't seem like there was enough slack in any of the cabling. That might be doable to some degree. I'll have to check. I'll go ahead and try to remove some of the connectors and screws and stuff and just see what I can do here with it in place and I'll give you an update when I get to that point. Okay now I got the board out and I'll go ahead and do a quick overview of what I did. It's kind of tough. I'm a one-man cameraman here. I didn't bring my tripod outside, so I wasn't able to document the exact process. But basically what happens after those screws are removed, there's a series of clips, and then the thing should just more or less lift straight up. You kind of want to watch out for the getting things getting bound up on the cables and on these white things. That's something to watch out for. It looks like I managed to break one of the screw things off. I can probably just glue this back on and it might be dry by the time I get back or oh, I don't think I have the glue here. Well at any rate the board is now out. This is what it looks like when it is out of the television. You kind of want to be careful with it especially when you're handling it too. These heat sinks can be pretty sharp. I do believe I was able to cut myself on one last time when I did this repair and also with these three screws out there's not a whole lot holding this thing in place anymore so this kind of flops around you don't want to lift up by that that's just something to kind of keep in mind but after that then the next step will be to take it onto the bench fire up the soldering iron we will have to release the clips for these actually this whole heatsink is going to have to come off anyway I believe the, the releases there are somewhere inside of one some of these fins. Those come off, the heat sink comes off. At that point, then we will be able to flip the board over and reflow these connections there where they connect on the other side of the board. Then we'll wipe the, the heat sink compound off of the chips and the heat sink. We'll apply some new heat sink compound and then basically follow the whole process in reverse, put the board back in, plug everything in. In my case, of course, I'm going to have to put the screen and the upper cabinet back on. After I got it all back in, we will clean the dust out, put everything back together, and it should work more consistently. It is worth mentioning that if 
your television is basically permanently stuck in that state of things not looking quite right and it's not an intermittent issue the running of those ICs out of spec for too long could have permanently damaged them so they may need to be replaced instead of just reflowed in that case you can get a pair of them I think reputable online stores still still sell a pair of them for thirty five dollars the number on them is covered up by that clip but when you come when it comes off then it'll be there will be a number on there for the Mitsubishi's it's usually STK three nine two one ten for the one upstairs we replaced them with STK three nine two dash one eighties for other sets obviously they'll have different ICs and even with different Mitsubishi models this is like their 2002 2003 model year ones there's a database online where you can find out what the exact numbers are though you will wanna either get the exact ones that it originally had in it or replacements that are confirmed as compatible with whatever it started out with and we're back here again a couple hours later with the operation moved indoors at this point I finally got some glue and we're gonna go ahead and try to glue this thing back into place and there it is perfect looks almost like it was never broken in the first place so while we're waiting for that to dry well, I'll go ahead and discuss what's happened since the last video update here basically while this was still outside I took the air compressor and cleaned a whole world of dust out of this thing basically because of the you know the nature of how this works there's just a lot of dust that tends to be attracted to those surfaces in there so that's just kind of the nature of the beast and things have to be cleaned out got the back the sides lenses everything all cleaned off I'm gonna probably go over the lenses a little bit later very carefully from what I understand, you have to be very, very careful with those lenses because they're made of a very soft material that's quite easy to scratch. Over here on the table, we can get a better look at the convergence IC situation. I apologize for not having better coverage on this, but basically, the way that this all works here, you can use a wedge a screwdriver in there to get one side of either of these clips off, and then those will just pop right off. And then after that, the only thing securing this giant heat sink to the I see is, is basically the attractive effect of the thermal compound that's on there so I figured you know since it's had the same thermal compound on it for probably 13 years or more that it'd be time to clean that off and replace it with something new so I cleaned both the ICs and the heat sink and applied some fresh thermal compound to that I also went ahead and touched up all the soldering here this is where those ICs connect I just added basically a little bit of solder and make sure that it all flowed they're all now shiny and there shouldn't be any cold joints on those and as long as we caught the problem soon enough I don't know how long the previous owner or previous owners ran it the way it was then we should be good to go without having to replace the ICs even if we do end up having to do that I believe they only run right around thirty five dollars for a set if they're the same price as they were last time so this should be good to go as soon as that glue dries okay so I got it back in and here's some pointers for getting this back in because it's kind of difficult it's a it's a big board going in a tight awkward space the key here is basically to take your time these things again you want to have them turned and then after you get them back in then it can go there but you want to make sure that nothing's pinching back here the board kind of has to go in like this and then slide in underneath this lip which is kind of annoying but that's just the way it works and then it's just a matter of reconnecting all the cables and connectors and putting all the screws back in yes you did read that right and no it was not a typo it really has been a year and a half that's passed since I recorded the first half of this video so as we wrap up the year and wrap up another season of the channel I'd like to give you three quick points to close things out for the Mitsubishi WSA65 V-Log. Alright, point number one. As you'll see in a moment here, the Convergence IC repair was a complete success. A year and a half later, I've had absolutely no problems with the Convergence or the Convergence ICs. I definitely got to those ICs soon enough, and I haven't had any issues with them whatsoever. I have the feeling that there won't be any issues with them for a long, long time. 
to be honest, there's really very little more to say about that topic. I covered pretty much everything about it that needs to be covered in the first half of the video. However, as we move on here, things definitely muddy a little bit. Thing number two, while the Convergence IC repair was arguably a complete success, it was found to be not the only issue that was plaguing this television. And if I knew then what I know now, I probably would not have even bothered to pick it up in the first place. Which is a shame, because it's a pretty nice television, and I've been pretty happy with the way that it performs. It definitely, if I were to take a guess, has pretty low hours on it. The Mitsubishis don't offer any kind of counter in the menu like they do on the on their newer digital sets. So I'm only left to, to speculate, but I would have to say that it's probably pretty low hour based on how crisp the image still is. And as such, I was able to turn down the contrast and the brightness to preserve that crispness for as long as possible. But more to the point, after I had done the Convergence IC repair, almost the very next day, I went into this room and went to use this thing, and I found that it was not working right. The power light on the front was just flickering, which it's not supposed to do, ever, under any circumstance. And when I cracked the thing open, I discovered that there had been some liquid that had somehow leaked down onto one of the connectors that goes between the main board and the power supply board, which I later found out was CRT coolant. Now, quick background for those of you who aren't familiar, and I imagine at this point most of my viewers probably aren't. I know I certainly wasn't before I embarked on this journey. CRT rear projection technology uses a kind of an oil-based coolant both as a means to cool the face of the tubes and also as an optical coupling between the face of the tube itself and the very first layer of the, the optical lenses. Unfortunately, the coolant that is used is both conductive and highly corrosive, so if it leaks out of where it's supposed to be, then bad things have the tendency to happen. The moral of the story between that and the convergence ICs, as it applies to CRT rear projection, is that if you don't fix the problems right away, they don't get better on their own, they almost always get worse. In my case, the problem emerged practically overnight. Like I said, I had entered into this room to use the television, I found that the, the light was blinking and that there was liquid on that connector between the main board and the power supply board. I troubleshot it a little bit, but ultimately it was beyond my ability to repair, so I did end up having to replace the power supply board at an expense of around $38, which given the cash value of these things these days is really more than I wanted to spend, but I reluctantly plunked it down since I figured that was probably the last hurdle to overcome with it. Unfortunately, this television came to be what I would call a lemon, in that after I had replaced the power supply board and spent a year wrestling with the the red CRT coolant leak, and ultimately patching it up using JB Weld, other coolant leak problems started to emerge. Most coolant leaks in these start from the bottom of the tube. It leaks down. In the case of the red, it was leaking from the top, from the, the metal shield that sits right below the projection lenses. After I fixed the red leak, satisfied that I had solved finally all of this television's problems. I put everything back together, rolled it into this corner, and used it for a while. And for a matter of months it gave me no problems. Until one day after I had used it for playing internet radio on this thing's remarkably good for built-in television speakers, another issue reared its head, and in that particular case the television continued to run and it continued to play the audio, but the, the video had just completely blanked out and it wasn't responding to button presses on the front panel or on the remote anymore. So I knew something was wrong. Eventually I think I had to unplug the mains power in order to, to get it to shut off at all. So I pulled off the front maintenance panel here, which is kind of handy since it prevents me from having to monkey around with pulling it away from its position here against the wall, and the nature of the problem immediately became apparent. That being that coolant had leaked down, this time from the blue tube onto the rightmost board, and in the area close to the controller, likely shorting out the power button, so the television probably just thought that someone was holding down the power button and not letting go, or something along those lines. 
Thankfully, after cleaning up that coolant leak and finding no permanent damage, I put everything back together and have and adopted a new strategy, which is the one I'm using now. That being that I'm just going to try to run it as often as I can in order to bleed out the excess coolant that's in there and relieve any stress on the system so that it won't leak anymore. And hopefully after that, it'll be fine. In the meantime, here we are. It's running and everything looks great. Pretty good for CRT rear projection and Finding a good one is pretty difficult at this stage because a lot of people have run them uh, both for a lot of hours and also with the brightness and contrast at full blast, which really takes its toll on the technology after a while. So with that all being done, thing number three that I just wanted to talk about briefly here before we end this video is software and other issues. In this case, the WSA65 is one of those weird Best Buy exclusive models. And it's basically very similar to the ordinary models. They got their own exclusive models for, I would imagine, two reasons. Number one being so that people can't price match, and number two so that they could, you know, get a cheaper set and increase their profit margins. Which as a business strategy is totally fine, and I respect that. What I don't respect, however, are the compromises that came in the software as a result of certain decisions here. For example, as I flip through the video settings, you'll notice that they're all the standard Mitsubishi settings but one thing is missing, and that is the option for VSM sharpness. Now you'd think, well, if they don't have the option in the menu, then it's probably not a feature present on the set, and therefore it's not something you ever have to worry about turning on. But you, like me, would be wrong for making that assumption. And the reason for that is because not only is the option there, but it is also enabled by default for some reason. And there's no way to turn it off in the user menu. However, the way that I got things looking so good is that I drilled into the service menu and disabled it through there. This is generally something that's not typically recommended, but it's not too bad. I'm overlaying this right now with some footage that I shot last year of adjusting the setting, and it, it makes a world of difference, especially in the modern high-definition age, turning off you know, artificial edge enhancement and stuff. It really makes a lot of difference. And in this case, it's not done by input. You actually have to do it once for each resolution. You have to do it once for 1080i, once for 480p, and if I'm not mistaken, you might also have to do it for 480i as well, but I don't remember for sure. At any rate, it wasn't that difficult to disable, and now that I've done it, this thing looks better than it ever did or ever could have brand new. So it's a real shame that they not only stuck these things with bad settings by default, you know, with the contrast jacked all the way up and the VSM on, but also that they didn't even offer a way to turn off VSM. I don't know if I want to go as far to say that I'm going to call that planned obsolescence, but it's definitely something that I was disappointed to see. At any rate, the takeaway from this is that these high definition CRT rear projection are a way better buy here on the used market where you can get them for $50 or $20 or in many cases free than they were brand new when they cost thousands of dollars. If you ask me, that was highway robbery back then, especially when there was so little content that was either widescreen or high definition. Blu-ray disc and HD DVD didn't really come on the scene until 2006 or so, and high-definition television didn't even start becoming really truly mainstream, I would say, until somewhere between 2008 and 2010. So by the time the original owner got done with this, he or she wouldn't really have even had the opportunity to enjoy it to its fullest. Now, I'm not saying that these don't display standard def content really well, because they do. CRT rear projection can actually render 480i and 480p signal very effectively and in a way that can in some cases look better than it does on an HD fixed pixel display. In fact, this one being so crisp, you can actually see the scan lines when you're looking at standard definition content. So it, it does look pretty good for that, but where it really shines is with the HD video. I can say objectively that it is not as crisp as a flat panel, but it's reasonably close, and for the price, I absolutely cannot complain about the video quality, especially the sound quality, which is better than any other built-in television sound system that I've ever heard in my life, by a wide margin, we'll say that. So at the end of the day, do I recommend this or similar high-definition CRT rear projection products? The answer is yes, but with caveats. If you can get one that's either fully working, 
or fully working with the exception of convergence ICs, then that's a good buy as long as it's free or pretty darn close there too. However, if there are any kind of weird issues that may be caused by coolant leaks, such as strange intermittent video problems, weird issues relating to things powering on or powering off by themselves, not wanting to power on or not wanting to power off, then that's definitely something to watch out for. I'm not saying that those can't be a good value or an easy fix in and of themselves, but after having gone through the experience that I went through, I can't say that it's something that most people would want to deal with either. Two other things to consider with using high definition CRT rear projection in modern times are number one is that they often don't support 720p. Some nicer models will take 720p and convert it back to 1080i since most of these can't display 720p natively, but many cannot do that and some of the other ones that can take it will just down convert it to 480p. So that's not a problem with systems like the Xbox 360, most cable boxes, or the Nintendo Wii, which doesn't even support high definition, but for systems that demand 720p compatibility, in many cases such as most PlayStation 3 games, or the Xbox One system in general, then that becomes a problem, in addition to the fact that many of these don't have digital video input. The other issue worth pointing out is that oftentimes due to the extreme amount of image cutoff, there may be cases where details on the edges of the screen just aren't visible. These things are kind of sloppily and hastily calibrated from the factory, which is a disappointment given their extremely high original retail price point, but it is what it is. You lose more image with CRT rear projection than with almost any other display medium. So that's another very important thing to keep in mind. At this point I would say it's still watchable, but there's, there's definitely times when it's very obvious that certain elements were not carefully planned with regard to overscan. With those concerns in mind, however, it's my opinion that this is still an excellent value here and going into 2018, even all these years after these were discontinued, if for no other reason than the fact that they are extremely cheap. So as long as you have a way to transport them, then you can get large HD quality for an extremely competitive price. Right now, the, the market is rejecting these types of things en masse. So for most people, there should be no problem finding one locally using tools such as Craigslist or eBay for an extremely attractive price. Like I said, in many cases, that being zero. So with that in mind, I want to thank you all for sticking around. Well, I wish you all a merry 2018 as Channel 2012, now the all-new Browning Gate, hurdles into the future here, celebrating our five-year anniversary of the relaunch. So as always, thanks for watching. This is Browning Gate signing off.